Again, welcome everyone to The Nature of Oaks with author Doug Tallamy. The Maynard Council on Aging and the Friends of the Maynard Public Library are pleased to bring this program to you. It was Council on Aging Director Amy Loveless who had the brilliant idea to suggest tonight's speaker, and we thank her for that. Please use the Q&A feature in Zoom to enter your questions at any time, and we will answer as many as we can in the final portion of the program. For those of you in the watch party here at the library, please give Amy your questions at the end and she will type them into the Q&A for you. For those at home, you can turn on captioning if you'd like to have the caption text displayed during the talk. And now it is my honor to introduce our speaker. Doug Tallamy is a professor in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware, where he has authored 111 research publications and has taught insect-related courses for 42 years. Chief among his research goals is to understand the many ways insects interact with plants and how such interactions determine the diversity of animal communities. Doug is author of Bringing Nature Home, Nature's Best Hope, and The Nature of Oaks, and is co-founder with Michelle Alfandari of Homegrown in National Park, a nonprofit organization, which you can learn more about at hnpark.org and I will put that link in the chat area as well. With that, we welcome you, Doug, and turn things over to you. Thank you very much, Jean. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you tonight about the nature of oaks, but specifically the nature associated with oaks, all of the species that depend on oaks. But before we do that, let's remind ourselves what E.O. Wilson told us way back in 1987, that insects are the little things that run the world. Uh, and he had one simple message in that paper. Life as we know it depends on insects. That means we've got a problem today because our insects are disappearing. We've already lost more than 45% of the insects on planet Earth. And we've lost them because lights kill insects. Neonicotinoids kill insects and they're used in all that light green area. Deforestation kills insects, cars kill insects, climate change kills insects. When you take an area like this and you turn it into that, it kills insects. What does any of this have to do with oaks? Well, there's no better way to share our spaces with insects than to plant an oak. And I'm going to try to convince you that by following oaks that we planted on our property. Uh, shortly after we moved in, my wife and I moved into a 10 acre plot in Oxford, Pennsylvania in the year 2000. It was a very old farm, been farmed for almost 300 years. Uh, and the last thing they did was mow it for hay, but they took it out of mowing three years before we moved in. Uh, and when you mow for hay in Southeast Pennsylvania, what you're really mowing is all the rootstocks of all of the invasive plants, multiflora rose and oriole bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle and autumn olive and on and on and on. So when they stopped mowing, what came back? That's what our property looked like. Um, you can't restore uh, anything when you've got all that stuff around. So we got rid of it. And by we, I mean my wife, Cindy. Uh, you know, invasive plants are a serious, serious issue. They're ecological tumors. And most people just feel like giving up because they're so hard to get rid of. But Cindy got rid of them. And if she can do it, you can do it too. Um, what was I doing? I was planting plants, particularly oaks. Uh, the first year, that we moved in, there was uh, a, an oak mast in the white oak group, and there are a couple of white oaks down the street about a mile, and they dropped a lot of acorns. So I gathered them up, I planted them, they germinate in the fall, members of the white oak group germinate in the fall, and that's what they look like. And then they sent up their first leaves the following spring, and that's what they look like. And that's about all they do that first year, and it gives people the impression that they're growing very, very slowly. Uh, well, in fact, they're not growing that slowly. It's just that most of the growth is happening below ground and we can't see it. Here's the little oak we're going to follow. Uh, and in that first year of its life, it put on more than 10 times more root biomass than above ground leaf biomass. I've got it uh, caged, keep the deer off. Well, we don't cage our oaks these days, the deer get them right away. Uh, but this is what that oak looked like 18 years later, 45 feet tall. Uh, 47 inch circumference, a canopy spread of 30 feet. It's still a baby, of course, but it's a real landscape tree and it didn't take all that long. One of the points I wanna to make tonight uh, is that oaks really are a lifeline to an awful lot of species. There are dozens of species of birds that depend on oaks, um, a number of, of mammals, including some rodents, big guys, bears, um, 
particularly in the old days when we had large oaks in the woods, the bears would spend the winter uh, in, in the uh, cavities of those trees. Raccoons and possums, not that many uh, reptiles are associated with oaks, but there are several species of butterflies that specialize on oaks. Hundreds of species of moths depend on them as well as their predators and parasitoids. Um, again, hundreds of species of gall wasps depend on oaks. And then many beetles, June, June beetles, longhorn beetles, metallic wood boring beetles, weevils. Uh, and when you dip below the tree and start looking at oak leaf litter, then you've got lots of spiders in there. Dozens more species of arthropods and mollusks and annelids uh, that depend on that oak leaf litter. So you're really talking about a very diverse web of life that's associated with oaks. And the problem is it goes unnoticed. And if it's unnoticed, it's unappreciated. And that is exactly why I wrote The Nature of Oaks. It is a month by month guide to the life of, of, uh, that occurs on your, your oaks. And the goal was to provide the knowledge that generates interest. And interest often leads to compassion. And then hopefully compassion leads to action. We need a lot more compassion and action towards uh, saving our biodiversity. So first, a few facts. The genus Quercus, that's where the oaks are and the genus Quercus, it's a large one. Contains 91 species in North America, 435 species globally. And for a deciduous tree, that's a very large genus. Uh, the word comes from the Celtic quer, meaning fine, quez meaning tree, and oaks are indeed fine trees. There are four taxonomic sections uh, that are common in North America. And I'll mention them because you do hear about them. You hear about the white oak group. That's in the Quercus uh, group. Red oak group is Lobati. The live oak group is Varentes and a smaller canyon oak group called Protobalanus. This is the distribution of oaks. There's at least one species of oak that occurs everywhere except in the brown. So uh, the most of the higher Rockies and particularly in the north and the dry upper plains don't have any oaks, but every other place does. Center of distribution in North America is the southeast, uh, but actually there are 200 species of oaks that occur in Mexico. Um, so a lot of oaks down there. Oaks live a, long, a very long time, and people argue about how long. Data from Europe suggests they live, on average, 900 years. 300 years of growth, 300 years of stasis, 300 years of decline. And during each one of those periods, they're delivering unique ecosystem services. So a lot of times we hear, well, an oak is 100 years old. It's a really old one. It really isn't. And the reason they don't often last that long is that we don't treat them very well. And we'll talk about why in a few minutes. What's the oldest oak in the country? Again, people argue about that. Could be a coastal live oak uh, in, in um, it's called the Pacheca oak, estimated to be 2000 years old. But if you really want the oldest oaks, you have to go to a, a small oak called the Palmer oak, uh, where it roots in one place and grows for a while and then dies and roots in another place. It's the same individual and just kind of marches across the land. Um, specimens like this have been estimated to be 13,000 years old. So some of the very oldest uh, living things on the planet are oaks. They can get big. This was the Y oak in Y, uh, Maryland. It was the largest white oak in the country. And again, you know, you see oaks like this and you think if I plant an oak, it's going to be way too big for my yard. But there are a number of species of oaks that are fairly small and you can use them in small yards. And then finally, I'm going to stress that oaks have superior ecological function. They have uh, what I call the highest biodiversity value, meaning they are supporting more species than other trees. They're sequestering more carbon dioxide. Excuse me, I'm going to choke here. Um, and that's, of course, very important today, pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, out of harm's way, and locking it up in their tissues, and then holding it all those years. Uh, they're also the best soil stabilizers because of those large root systems we talked about. They make the best leaf litter, meaning it lasts the longest. So the leaf litter that draws from oaks gets to do the job of leaf litter longer than for other trees. And all of that promotes healthier watersheds. I started the book in October, uh, and everybody wants to know why I started in October, because October is when my wife, Cindy, said, you should write a book about about oaks. And I looked out the window, there's our oaks. I said, okay, we'll do it. And October is when uh, we're noticing those acorns. Acorns are, are probably the most noticeable feature of, of oaks. And in late September and early October, they are dropping from the trees. And a single oak 
can make a lot of acorns, up to 3 million acorns in its lifetime. And each one of those acorns is a, uh, a wonderful little morsel of food for a lot of creatures. It's very, very high in fats and protein, and many animals do depend on those acorns. Uh, again, a number of rodents do, but those black bears, they're scouring the woods, eating as many acorns as they can in the fall and putting on layers of fat that help them get through the winter. But raccoons eat acorns, possums eat acorns, squirrels eat acorns. Those cute little deer we all love so much depend on acorns. And a number of birds depend on acorns too. Uh, turkeys do just what the black bears do. They're walking around all fall eating as many acorns as, as possible so that they can put down a layer of fat that gets them through the winter. But red belly woodpeckers depend on acorns, tip mice, towhees, believe it or not, um, flickers, ducks. Many ducks uh, love acorns, particularly wood ducks. When a viable acorn falls and hits the water, it sinks. So the ducks dive down, get them off the, the floor of the pond or the river, and they come up on the land and they eat those, those acorns as well. Uh, and sandhill cranes. Um, we don't see too many sandhill cranes these days, but uh, they uh, particularly historically depended on acorns in the fall to get them through the winter. <clears throat> Number of invertebrates depend on acorns, like the acorn weevil. This is a acorn weevil larva tunneling out of an acorn, and that's what the acorn weevil itself looks like. They can be really common in acorns. This is called the acorn moth. It's actually a species complex, several species, but they all look the same. Uh, and they're doing what the acorn weevil does. The larva caterpillar de develops inside of acorns, and then they tunnel out and become the acorn moth. So you have all these things eating acorns. Uh, and if you go and look under a tree, maybe a week and a half, two weeks after those acorns drop, it's utter destruction. Um, all the viable acorns have been taken away uh, or eaten or, or crushed. And you might wonder how oaks ever successfully reproduce. Well, this is where a, a very ancient mutualism uh, between oaks and jays comes into play. <clears throat> they both evolved pretty much at the same time, about 56 million years ago in what is now the Arctic, <clears throat> and right away they got to know each other and like each other. Um, jays, of course, get food from oaks in the form of those acorns. What do jays do for oaks? Well, they provide mobility. Um, jays are dispersing those acorns and they allow oaks to move farther and faster than any other deciduous tree in the world. And this is how that works. Uh, when jays pick up acorns, they store them for winter food. They don't cache them, so they're not piling a bunch in one place. They bury them individually. Even though they'll carry more than one acorn at a time, they will bury them individually. So what they do is they pick up an acorn and then they fly up to a mile uh, before burying that acorn. And actually read not long ago, a mile and a half. So they go a good distance from the tree. Then they find a disturbed area and tap the acorn beneath the, the soil surface. <clears throat> now, if they think another jay watched them do that, They'll wait around for a few minutes, then they'll dig up the acorn and they'll move it because jays know that jays steal acorns. And of course, the object is they're going to go back in the wintertime, find that acorn and have something to eat. They can be very busy in, in the fall, particularly during a mast year. A single jay can bury 4,500 acorns. The key is it only remembers where one out of every four acorns is, which means a single jay can actually plant 3,360 oak trees each year. And if they're doing that a mile or a mile and a half from the parent tree, that's a dispersal rate much farther than other organisms move acorns. It's not just blue jays that are doing it. Uh, all the species of jays do it. We have seven or eight species of jays in, in this country, including uh, scrub jays, Stellar's jay, the Mexican jay, the green jay, the pinion jay, they're all moving acorns in the same way. Um, acorn woodpeckers in the southwest, very beautiful bird, also have a specialized relationship with acorns. Um, ecologically, they're doing pretty much the same thing. They're storing acorns for the use during the winter time, but they don't store them underground. They store them above ground in what we call acorn trees, trees where they have drilled holes then they stuff an acorn in there and that acorn will spend the winter safe and sound in that hole. Well, acorn trees are used year after year and there can be up to, well, many thousands, uh, 50,000 holes in an acorn tree, uh, which makes it a very valuable resource. So uh, acorn woodpeckers work as family units in protecting that resource and they'll chase away any other uh, acorn uh, woodpeckers 
So it, the, the end result is that if you have an acorn tree in your yard, it turns out to be enormously entertaining. Okay, November is when you might look back and say, well, they, gee, there were a lot of acorns this year, were not many at all. Rarely do we have just a moderate amount of, of acorns. When you have a lot, it's called a mast year. And when you have very few, we don't call it anything. But that asynchronous type of, of reproduction is unusual, so we need to explain it. And at least four hypotheses have been advanced to explain why oaks mast. Predator satiation, predator reduction, improved pollination, and energy partitioning. Uh, and these are not mutually exclusive. They all could be operating at the same time. So let's talk about each one of those. Predator satiation, that's an acorn weevil outside of the acorn. And as I said before, they can be really numerous in acorns. Up to 90% of the acorns can have an acorn weevil in them. Well, imagine if oaks made the same number of acorns every single year. The population of acorn weevils and acorn moths and squirrels and deer and all the other things that depend on acorns would stabilize around that constant resource and they'd eat all the acorns. Oaks would hardly be able to reproduce. But if they make variable numbers of acorns, so let's say they make a whole bunch one year and you get a big population of squirrels and of acorn weevils, uh, and then the next year there's almost none. Then the populations of these acorn predators decrease, they crash, there's actual starvation. And usually oaks go uh, several years in between mass. So it keeps the population of the acorn uh, eaters down and then there's another mast year, and that allows the, the uh, oaks to swamp the number of, of uh, acorn eaters. And that's, that's how you get some actual reproduction. Improved pollination. <clears throat> oaks are wind pollinated, which is a game of chance. They just release their pollen on the wind and it blows around. Uh, so these are the male catkins, that's where the pollen comes from. These are the female flowers, tiny little inconspicuous things uh, that people don't even notice. Now, the key is that a single oak cannot pollinate itself because its pollen is released before its own flowers mature. So it has to receive pollen from another tree. And if oaks all over the place are releasing their pollen at the same time, there's a much greater chance that you will get successful pollination and that adds to masting. Then finally, energy allocation. By the way, if you're wondering whether oaks can have good fall color, they can. This is a scarlet oak in my yard, very beautiful tree. Energy allocation, there's never enough energy to go around. So oaks tend to partition it very, very uh, discreetly. They will either put a lot of energy into reproduction, making acorns, or a lot of energy into growth, but rarely do they do both at the same time. So again, those four hypotheses are not mutually exclusive. They all could be contributing to the evolution of oak masting. Okay, December. December is when you might notice another unusual feature of oaks, particularly in the white oak group, and that is, uh, it's called marcescence. They don't drop their leaves. This is a deciduous tree that hangs onto its leaves all winter long. Um, so it's a funny word, but that we describe this as marcescence, and again, very unusual. Most deciduous trees drop all their, their leaves, but oaks uh, do not. So why? Well, uh, uh, the leading hypothesis in this case is that it wasn't that long ago, eight, 9,000 years ago, when there were a lot of large Pleistocene mammals around. This is the group of large mammals that occurred in Mexico alone. Three species of mammoths, the giant sloth that could reach up 18 feet, camels and elk, and I think the earth had 44 species of rhinoceros. Um, so a lot of things were out there, including uh, deer, and many of them were browsers, just like our white-tailed deer. Uh, and browsers are not out there eating the grass in your front lawn. They are eating woody material, particularly buds during the winter time that will become next year's growth because that's where all the nutrition is. Well, if oaks protect those buds with the dead leaves from the previous year, it makes it a very uh, untasty, unpalatable mouthful. And the distribution of marcescent leaves supports that hypothesis because they're only on the lower part of the, of the tree. When you get up about 18 feet, um, then the mar marcescent stops. There's no, no leaves being uh, retained up there. So it's impossible to test this hypothesis now, but it does make a nice story. And marcescence provides oaks with a, uh, a very nice landscape trait, and that is that you can use them as a screen all year long. So if you don't like your neighbor, you can plant a white oak and screen them out both in the summer and the wintertime, and it'll be great. 
Okay, January. This is, of course, when it's cold and people are not outside staring up in, in their oaks very much. But if you if you do, uh, you're likely to see tiny little birds up there flitting around. Uh, you might say, oh, they're up there playing. Birds don't play. Uh, they're on very tight energy budgets. Um, so with tiny birds, I'm talking about things like uh, chickadees and things like titmice and things like the, the uh, golden crown kinglet. <clears throat> well, chickadees and titmice, of course, are birds at our feeder all winter long. And we think that's all they need is seeds. Well, only 50% of their diet is seeds in the winter time. Um, and the rest is insects and spiders. So maybe they're up in our oaks looking for insects and spiders. Uh, but we know there's not many insects and spiders in oaks during the winter time. So it's a little confusing. This is really confusing, the golden crown kinglet, uh, because it's not a seed eater at all. It's entirely an insectivore. It should have migrated to where there's a lot of insects in the winter time, but it doesn't. It stays here in the winter time. And that has created what we call the kinglet paradox. Why are they here when they're eating insects that aren't here? Well, Bern Heinrich, um, he's actually a retired entomologist. He writes a natural history column in the magazine Natural History every year. He does not like paradoxes. <clears throat> so he actually looked in the crops of golden crown kinglets in Maine in January, and he found they were full of caterpillars, caterpillars just like this. And it turns out that there are a lot of caterpillars up in oak trees, even in the wintertime. We don't see them because they look just like sticks. And when it gets really cold, there's one right there, they shrink a little bit, uh, but they don't freeze because they've got antifreeze proteins in their cells that keep their cells from bursting. And then when it warms up, they, they swell a little bit, but they really are just sitting there all winter long uh, because there is nothing for them to eat. <clears throat> so there's no more kinglet paradox, but now we have to wonder what, what are the caterpillars doing up there? Why are they there? Most insects overwinter as eggs or they overwinter as, as pupae or chrysalids. Uh, and, or a few of them overwinter as adults, but very few overwinter as larvae, as caterpillars. Uh, well, if you think about it, if you overwinter as an egg in the spring, you have to hatch out and then you're a tiny little thing. Uh, so in the spring, of course, that's when these new leaves are bust, busting out full of, of nutrition. If you are a large caterpillar, you can easily outcompete any of those tiny guys that have just hatched. If you overwinter as an adult, you've got to emerge as an adult. Or, or as a pupa, you've got to emerge as an adult and find a mate and then lay eggs. So again, those caterpillars can easily outcompete uh, those, those tiny little caterpillars. Um, so again, we, uh, very tough to, to test this hypothesis, but um, that is our best guess, that they have a competitive edge, endless amounts of resources if they make it through the winter as a large larva. <clears throat> February is the quietest time of year for oaks biologically. So it's a good time to talk about oak landscaping myths. And there are a number of them. I hear these all the time. Oaks are too expensive to use. They grow too slowly to use as landscape plants. And then they get too big. I hear people say, I'm not gonna plant an oak because I won't, I won't live long enough to enjoy it. Um, and it'll get too big and, and ruin my, my yard. It'll fall over and crush my house. It'll lift up my, my hardscape. Well, you know, myths often have some uh, amount of facts associated with them. So let's look at each one of these and decide what is fact and fiction. Do oaks uh, or arcs, are oaks too expensive to use as landscape trees? They can be if you insist on instant gratification, if you insist on planting a large tree, and a lot of people do insist on that. You actually can pay thousands of dollars for, uh, for a large oak. Uh, <clears throat> now, it used to be that uh, when we grew trees in pots and they got to any size, they became root bound. Uh, the roots went around and around and around. And if you plant that, uh, they'll continue to go around and around. And they'll eventually strangle the tree and die. So you never want to plant a, a, uh, an oak that is root bound. But these are called, this is new technology, it's called air pots. Uh, and now you can grow large trees in pots without them becoming root bound. But they end up with a very small amount of root mass um, compared to the amount of tree that they have to uh, service, uh, which means when you plant them, they sit there for a long time trying to build up the root mass necessary to support the size of the tree. Uh, and that can be that can be problematic. Uh, this was a um, planting. Uh, it was at least ten oaks that I ran across a few summers ago uh, in Newark, Delaware. I don't know how much they spent on this, but every single one of those trees died. Whatever they spent was a total waste. And it was, it was because they insisted on planting large trees 
when they didn't have to. The other option is uh, bald and burlap, where they chop off the roots, wrap it up in burlap, and, and sell it to you in that state. Very hard on the trees again. And again, when you put it in the ground, uh, it's going to sit there and, and try to rebuild those, those roots. And that can take a decade to do. If I plant an acorn the same day I plant a tree like this, and I actually have done that, the acorn is going to be bigger and healthier at the end of 10 years than that tree I spent a lot of money on. And here is living proof of that. This is a willow oak uh, that I planted as an acorn the same day I planted this red oak that was 15 feet tall. The red oak has struggled ever since, uh, and the willow oak is doing really well. Now, I know it's not the same species. Willow oaks grow fast, but so do red oaks. It just gives you uh, an idea that planting from an acorn is okay. And of course, the acorn was free. Um, and this is a great way, a great uh, a size to plant your oak. Just find acorns in the fall, plant them, and in the spring, they get to about this size and stick them in the ground. Um, again, free. I'm not trying to kill the large tree industry for nurserymen, but I would love to have them offer small trees too, so that people who are not going to spend thousands of dollars uh, will have access to oaks. Um, the more and more uh, State Department of Natural Resources are offering uh, oak <clears throat> acorns uh, or even, even seedlings. I know Maryland does, Pennsylvania does, Virginia. I don't know about New England, but um, the demand for oaks is increasing, and that might be an option where you can actually get some free trees. Uh, and I'll mention very quickly, bare root oaks, just a couple of feet tall, um, are a great way to go, too. The survivorship is very high. They have very few roots associated with them, but they have no leaves associated with them, too. And you plant them in the spring, they'll do very well. But if you're planting a small oak, it brings up the next question. Do oaks grow too slowly? Are you going to be dead before you can enjoy your oak? <clears throat> well, let's have a race here between my little friend, Bella, uh, and people think she's my daughter, but she's not. She's not even my granddaughter, but she was our surrogate granddaughter until we found some real ones. This is the tree we're following. Uh, it's six years old at this point. We planted that from an acorn. Bella's two years old, but you know, it's a white oak. They're going to grow really slowly. Maybe Bella can catch up. Let's have a race. Here, the tree is seven years old, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, Bella is clearly losing, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20, 2020, Bella's got her mask on, so we know what year it is. Uh, Bella did not win this race, uh, and Bella did, she tried hard, she's 5'11", but the oak is, is uh, certainly much bigger. So I'm going to toss that out as a total myth. Oaks do not grow too slowly to use as landscape trees. After that first couple of slow years, they go as fast as anything else. <clears throat> and keep in mind, one of the reasons we want to plant more oaks these days is that they have such high biodiversity value. They are passing on their energy to the food web in your yard, and they do that the very first year. You don't have to wait decades or hundreds of years for them to start to support the life around you. This is a pin oak that's just popped its head above the leaves, and here's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of that tree. Are oaks too large to use in small yards? Uh, well, nobody, there's no landscape designer or landscape architect that's going to spec a large oak for a yard this small, but they used to. Um, these are, uh, this is a street lined with large oaks uh, as I drive into the university uh, in Newark, Delaware. Uh, and I'm sure these oaks were planted the same time these houses were built, which was more than 100 years ago. But remember, 100 years ago, there was no air conditioning. So these oaks uh, provided a valuable ecosystem service. They dropped the temperature of these houses by 10 degrees in the summertime, and they also protected them from wind during the wintertime. Uh, and they fill most of the yard. But again, nobody's going to recommend that. Look, they haven't lifted up the hardscape. They haven't fallen over and, and crushed the house. So these guys have gotten away with that. This is a very large oak next to a large church in Chestertown, Maryland. Fortunately, they didn't cut the oak down when they, when they built the church. Um, so again, you can find it. This is a very large Gary oak, Quercus Garyana in Portland, Oregon. It's one of the prized trees of the city, as a matter of fact. So it 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 does happen, but not recommended. Point is, there are small oaks that we can use. The yellow species here are all the small oaks that are found in Texas alone. In the east, this is the, the primary one, dwarf chestnut oak, Quercus prinoides, uh, would be the one you'd, you'd look for in New England. 
Um, this is what it looks like. Uh, this is a, a Quercus prinoides in my yard. They made acorns when they were five feet tall uh, and they don't ever get very big. So it's a, it's a perfect tree for a small yard. <clears throat> this is another option, coppicing. Uh, this is, uh, I got this from the web, so I'm not sure what it is. Probably a, a red oak, might be a scarlet oak. But what you do is you let your oak get to be two or three inches in diameter, then cut it off at the base. And when it comes back, it'll come back as a bush, as a shrub. And you can cut it off every time a leader takes over, every couple of years, cut it off again, and it'll stay a shrub. It'll stay a shrub for 200 years if you do that. So you get the advantage of oak foliage in your yard without a giant tree. And people ask, is it going to make acorns? No, it's not. It's, it stays in the juvenile state. This is a Quercus gariana that somebody has been chopping off again in Portland, Oregon. I don't know if they're doing it on purpose or not, but it shows you can have oak material in your yard without it being gigantic. But if you do let your trees get big, are they going to fall over and crush your house? Uh, well, they can. Big trees fall over. And when they do, we, we hear about it on the news. You know there is a rule in, in, in the news. You are not allowed to report any good news. You're only allowed to report when the tree falls over. You never report when the, the oak does not fall over during a storm. Uh, but trees fall over. And they fall over largely because of the way we plant them. We plant all of our trees as specimen trees. We don't want them near another tree so that they can reach their full grandeur and, and height and width. Um, but that means their root system never gets to interlock with another tree's root system, which provides stability in a forest. So when you get a lot of wind and rain, the soil loosens up, boom, over they go. This is the way trees grow in a forest. They grow close enough together that their roots are interlocked. It's very stable uh, and <clears throat> this is a, a, a natural planting in a stream cut near me where the soil is washed away and you get to see how the roots interlock. One, two, three, four trees here, um, a very stable matrix of roots. So when the tornado comes, it will snap them off, but it's not going to blow them over. By the way, there's no landscaping trip that's going to protect you from tornadoes, but high winds, yeah, this works. So instead of this, consider this. Like we call oak, oak groves or tree groves. They don't have to all be the same species where you plant them close enough together. Uh, this is natural. These are two white oaks. These are the white oaks where I got my original acorns, by the way, down the street. They're three feet apart. Again, nobody planted them. They put the road in afterwards. Neither one is as big as it would be if it were in isolation, but they haven't blown over. And our eyes will take them in as, as a group. Here are three red oaks in Northwest Connecticut called the Three Sisters. Um, so you can find this pretty commonly out in nature. This is a planned uh, planting. This is in Mount Cuba Center in Hocassin, Delaware. It's a DuPont estate dedicated to native plants. Um, it was a cornfield, but uh, you have a very large uh, red oak back here. Then you've got hemlocks. You've got large rhododendrons down here. And even in some hardscape, it looks very natural, but it was totally planned. Uh, but those roots are interlocked. Uh, and it provides habitat for a lot of things. If you have two or three acres of lawn, you're wondering, how can I reduce this lawn? Considering a, consider a tree grove like this, where you get one or more species closely planted together. Uh, you create a lot of habitat, and it's aesthetically pleasing. Will oaks lift up your, high, your hardscape? Uh, well, again, they can, depending on what you plant them over. If you plant them over bedrock, the only place the, the roots can go is laterally and they will lift up sidewalks. They will lift up driveways. But if you plant them where there's enough soil, uh, pretty much uh, they typically do not. This is a um, pin oak where those roots have easily gone down uh, under this, this road with no problem. These are two large red oaks at the University of Delaware, large trees right next to the curb, no problem at all. Now, it's not just bedrock that will prevent roots from penetrating. If you know that your, your uh, house is over what used to be a farm field, over agriculture. You may have a problem with what we call pan. So the plow went down maybe 15, 18 inches every year for centuries, and the, the soil beneath that plow got compacted. Um, so if you know you have, have agricultural pan, you do want to break that up because the roots will go down, hit the pan, and then go laterally, and that can cause problems. <clears throat> okay, March. This is when those marcescent leaves finally start to drop. So let's talk about the value of leaf litter. First, let's talk about how variable oak leaves can be. A lot of people think all oaks have lobes uh, on their leaves, and many of them do, but some of them do not. Uh, so for example, this is a, a shingle oak. 
um, no lobes at all. This is a, uh, a leaf from uh, live oak. Here's a willow oak down here. This one looks like a holly leaf, but it's the emery oak, the water oak. Um, so there's a lot of variability in oak leaves. When the lobes are rounded, it's in the white oak group. When they're pointed, it's in the red oak group. But oaks make a lot of leaves too, 700,000 leaves on a large tree. And if you line them up on the ground next to each other, it'll cover four tennis courts. And that is their job, to cover the ground. And remember, they're, they're lasting up to three years, each leaf, as opposed to a maple leaf or a tulip tree leaf that doesn't even make it through the summer. And when it doesn't make it through the summer, it means you've got bare soil. And bare soil is not at all healthy for the soil community. Um, when you have leaf litter covering the ground, it maintains the moisture in the ground. And that exactly what, is exactly what all the soil community creatures and fungi need. They need high moisture. There are more species that are found underground than there are above ground. They're all tiny, but they're all extremely valuable because what they're doing is breaking down that leaf litter, returning the nutrients that were in those leaves that the tree used one year into the soil so the tree can use it again. So of course, if you rake your leaves away, you have deprived the tree of all of those nutrients. And if you do that for 50 years, it really does shorten the lifespan of the, of the oak. But people worry, oh, if I leave the leaf litter in my flower beds, then the flowers won't be able to get through. Well, this is a fern. Uh, I'm not gonna call it a planting because nobody planted it, but the ferns get through um, easily. Um, and I just watch it at, at my house. These are wood poppies. Um, I, I, I'm never home long enough to rake my leaves. So um, they're, they're on their own and they do just fine. They pop right through. There it is early on. Here it is later on. The leaves are still there, but uh, no problem at all. Um, and uh, leaves make wonderful mulch. It's the best mulch there is. This is native Pachysandra. Here's uh, Virginia creeper uh, growing right over those leaf mulch um, and lots of other options. So you really can garden and keep the leaves on your property at the same time. Oak leaf litter is extremely rich in life. In one square meter, you can have 250,000 mites, 100,000 springtails. This is a smintherid springtail. 90,000 proturans, those are primitive little insects. Uh, and a million nematodes. And all of these guys are breaking down those leaves uh, and returning the nutrients to the soil. Some of our most, most beautiful butterflies depend on oak leaf litter, like the banded hair streak. Um, this butterfly is pretty common. We see it fairly often, but this is what the caterpillars eat, dead oak leaves. Never seen a caterpillar They're down there somewhere, but very hard to find. And as a matter of fact, there are 70 species of moths that we call litter moths because they're developing on leaf litter. Things like the ambiguous litter moth, the American idea, the dark spotted palthus, and 67 other species. When you see birds sitting on the ground like towhees or white-throated sparrows, and they're doing a little dance, what they're doing is kicking the leaves back with their their legs. And then they're hunting for these moths and, and caterpillars in that leaf litter. So when you throw away all your leaf litter, you're throwing away all of the food for those birds and a lot of biodiversity as well. Then of course you have the predators that are eating all of those things. And there's a lot of them. Uh, many species of ground beetles, spiders, centipedes, we talked about lightning bugs, people I see, or fireflies. How come I don't see fireflies the way I used to uh, when, when I was a kid? Uh, well, you know, they're not, they're not flies, they're not bugs, they are beetles. Here's the luminescent organ that the adults use to talk to each other. But this is what a firefly larva looks like. Looks like a little, little dinosaur. It is a predator in leaf litter. And when you throw away your leaf litter, you've thrown away the habitat that fireflies need. When you get a lawn service, you have poisoned your, your fireflies. When you keep your lights on all night long, you've messed up their sexual communication. So if you have fireflies in your yard, you're doing something right. Okay, April, <clears throat> that's when the buds uh, first start to break out and the new year really begins. Uh, and it's also the chance, the time where you have the opportunity to see one of the most ephemeral biological events in all of nature. It only takes about five minutes a year. Uh, it's, it's common, happens a lot, but only for five minutes. So you have to be looking at the right time. And I'm talking about when cynipid gall wasps lay their eggs in the buds of, of oaks. And that's what's going on here. This is a female cynipid gall wasp. That little structure right there is her ovipositor. She is injecting an egg into this bud. This is a male cynipid who has already mated with her, but he's hanging around because after she lays an egg in this bud, she's gonna go lay an egg in another bud. And he wants to make sure he's the father of that egg too. This is a male who wishes he was that male. 
here she is. She's laying her egg. Not only is she injecting an egg into the, the bud, but she's also injecting plant hormones that will direct the growth of the cells in this bud. These are undifferentiated cells. Think of them as stem cells. They can grow in any different way. So the resulting structure that comes from her injection of those plant hormones is a compromise between the hormone she's injecting and the, old, the oak's own plant hormones. They have hormones too. And what it, you end up with is a species-specific gall. Uh, you can identify the species of gall wasps that made that gall just by the structure of the gall. There are a lot of gall wasps out there. More than a thousand species of sinipid gallers are associated with oaks. A single tree can have 70 different species of, of gallers. And there's a lot of variation in, in oak galls that we'll look at in a second. Another feature of oaks, of oak galls, many of them anyway, is that they're hollow. This is the apple oak gall or the oak apple gall. I've seen it written both ways. And if you cut it open, you have a central disc in here, and that is where the galler is, the little larva is in there. And then you got this big open space. It's essentially hollow. And then the outside of the gall. What is that all about? Well, it turns out that, that sinipid gall wasps have more natural enemies, more parasitoids, other wasps like terimid wasps that lay their eggs in them, that parasitize them. Um, they're hit more than any other type of insect. So the hollow part of the gall is a defense against these these uh, parasitoids. Uh, this is a female pterimid. She's got a very long ovipositor. And the distance between the center of the gall where the galler is and the outside of the gall has to be bigger than the length of this ovipositor. Otherwise, she sits on the outside and she can reach it and parasitize it. In the beginning, the galls are very small. They grow quickly. But this is the opportunity for those gall wasps to reach the center and parasitize that galler. Uh, but very quickly, the, they'll grow to the point where it separates the galler from the outside of the gall and the ovipositor can't reach it. This is a pterimid on the west coast with the longest ovipositor and it's got the longest ovipositor because it has to reach into the largest gall uh, in the country on the, the Gary Oak. Uh, and of course it's the largest gall as a defense against that very long ovipositor. Again, a lot of, lot of variation in, in gall form and structure. Some of them are quite beautiful. Many of them are just uh, circles, uh, spheres on leaves or spheres on stems, uh, but some are, are pretty attractive. This is uh, looks like candy. This one looks like that. Uh, a lot of them look like diseases. This is actually one, two, three, four, five. These are each galls. Uh, people mistake them for plant diseases. This is the spindle gall, more candy. The, it turns out the, the um, Oak trees in California have a fantastic uh, uh, variety of, of galls. This is one looks like pottery. It's, it occurs at my house. Um, this is the cutest one. I call it the gnome house gall. That's not really a door. That's where the gall wasp has emerged um, after it has completed its development. The brain gall. Here's an interesting one. There's four large galls on a single oak leaf, and all these holes are where the sinipid gall wasps have emerged from these galls. So when the, the gall the galler laid eggs, it laid a lot of eggs, not just one, and they all developed in here together. So this single leaf produced a couple hundred uh, sinipid gall wasps. And it turns out that galls have played an interesting role in our recorded history. If you grind up a gall like this and combine it with particular chemicals, it makes an indelible black ink. And that is the ink that uh, humans recorded their history with uh, from the beginning thousands of years ago. The Bible was written with gall ink. The Magna Carta was written with gall ink. The Declaration of Independence was written with gall ink. So that's just a little factoid that you can share at your next cocktail party. May, this is when uh, the leaves fully expand and the new biological re year really takes off. Uh, and this is not just oaks, of course, but deciduous trees across the, the temperate zone are expanding very rapidly in May. And following that expansion comes the caterpillars that eat those leaves. And following the caterpillars that eat those leaves comes the birds that eat those caterpillars. It is not a coincidence that bird migration is timed so that they arrive right when there's a lot of caterpillars on those leaves to eat. That's what drives bird migration. It's not seeds or berries or fruits because the birds, the plants haven't made them yet in the spring. Um, birders, no, if you want to see particularly warblers, which are, you know, real insectivores, you go to oak trees, uh, because that's where they are. And they are there because that's where the most food is. I had a, a student several years ago, Christy Beal, who actually measured 
the uh, warbler activity, foraging activity on different plant families. So this first bar here, this is where on large trees and cemeteries, this is the Phagaceae, that's the family that oaks are in. Oaks, beeches, and chestnuts, but there were no beeches and chestnuts in her study site. So um, this is all oaks. And obviously this is the number of minutes that the birds spent foraging on those plants compared to pines, compared to birches and, and members of the Rosaceae. Uh, so uh, they're there because that is where the food is. And the food we're talking about, again, is caterpillars. Things like the purple crested slug, the buck moth, the white marked tussock moth, the saddle prominent, double line prominent, white dotted prominent, the checkered fringe prominent, the laugher. These are all oak leaders. The lace cap caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the skiff moth the white blotched heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the banded tussock moth, the red line panopoda, the yellow neck caterpillar, the smaller parasa, the unicorn caterpillar, the crown slug. These guys are called slugs because their heads are, are tucked up underneath. They're actually caterpillars, they are not slugs. The streak dagger moth, the epilated dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the red humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the confused wood grain, the spiny oak slug, and this is my favorite, the spun glass slug, and literally hundreds more species of caterpillars are found on oaks, and that's why the birds are there. Um, I put a lot of plants back in our yard, if you remember that opening picture. Uh, and those plants have supported a lot of caterpillars. We've, our research has shown that if you know the number of species of moths, not butterflies, but moths, in your local food web, you have a good index of how stable and productive that food web is. So five years ago, I started taking pictures of every species of moth I could find at our house, and I'm up to 1,199 species. 28% of them, that's a lot of, of species, are using the oaks in my yard. Uh, and because so many of those are types of bird food, we have recorded 61 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres. Not flew by, but bred. And that's why I call oaks keystone species. Remember what a keystone is. It's a stone in the middle of the arch. And if you take that stone out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, if you take keystone species out of your local food web, the food web collapses because they are making most of the food. Just 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. And oaks are the best keystone species in 84% of the counties in which they occur. They support more than 950 species of caterpillars nationwide. No other plant genus comes close to that. Why do we need so many caterpillars? Well, that is a good question. Uh, but it turns out that caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. If you just think about our birds, it takes thousands of caterpillars to get one clutch of birds to the point where they leave the nest. This is a Carolina chickadee, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars, depending on the number of chicks in the nest, to get those point, their birds to, to the point where they leave the nest. This, this bird's only a third of an ounce. That's four pennies worth of bird. And after they leave the nest, the, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars another 21 days. So you're talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars required to get one clutch of birds through to maturity. That's a lot of caterpillars. And if you want birds breeding uh, in your yard, you need all those caterpillars in your yard because these birds only forage about 50 meters from the nest. They're not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. And if we don't landscape in a way that creates all those caterpillars, we don't have breeding birds. Okay, June, cicada month. Uh, at least it was cicada month, um, what, almost two years ago now when we had a, the emergence of the periodical cicada. I don't believe you had it up there in Massachusetts. Uh, so I'll quick, quickly go through what, what we experienced here. Of course, we're talking about the periodical uh, and, and uh, well, the periodical cicadas, either the 17 year brood or the 13 year brood. We had the 17 year brood emerge and it's very predictable. You know, it's gonna happen, which means the media gets a hold of it. Uh, and for some reason, the media loves vilifying nature. Everything that happens in nature is, is bad. It's gonna hurt you. These are some of the things I heard either on the radio or the television. The cicada emergence is going to be a terrible scourge. We should all fear it. You might consider moving so you don't have to experience it. Um, women are going to go crazy and kill their babies because the noise will be too loud. It's an invasion. Everything I heard was negative. Well, it's none of those things. It's one of the most fantastic biological events you'll ever be privileged to witness. And it was a big one. These are the, the shed skins of the cicadas in front of an oak tree uh, in front of my building in, at Newark, Delaware. 
Um, and when, of course, when they come out of the ground, the nymphs are feeding on, on roots of trees uh, for 17 years. They come out synchronously and they leave holes in the ground. That is aerating the soil and allowing oxygen and moisture to get down to the roots. It's a very valuable ecosystem service. And you didn't have to pay for it. But there were a lot of cicadas, so many cicadas that the Mississippi kite, 11 Mississippi kites flew up to Newark, Delaware to eat our cicadas and they stayed for for uh, uh, what, two weeks eating them. More people came to see the Mississippi kites than, than anything else. This is the life cycle that come out at night, they hang upside down. Um, so they've just emerged from the ground. They will split the, the back of their skin and, and swing down and then hang from that skin while they are tanning their exoskeleton. They're hardening it, hardening it up. When they're vulnerable like this, they're like a soft shell crab, anything can eat them. And that's why this happens at night. So they'll hang there several hours until uh, their exoskeleton is hard enough that they can fly away. Then they can start their life cycle. This is a male and he's going to sing. He's a going, actually gonna buzz. He's got two membranes in his thorax uh, that are, that are kind of like the tympanum in our ears. They vibrate, but, but it's more like a clicking. So if you're clicking a Coke can, click, 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 they do that really fast, so 450 times a second, something like that. And it creates a buzz and they do it as loud as they can because females will go to the males who are clicking and buzzing the loudest because that's a signal of male health. They wanna mate with the healthiest male. Well, that male succeeded. He attracted a female, they mated and now it's her turn. She's gonna lay her eggs in the stems of trees. Many of them are oaks. So what she's doing here, this is her ovipositor. She is jamming it into a pin oak twig in my front yard. This is hard to do. Get a pin and try to stick it into an oak twig and see if you can do it without bending the pin. But she does it. She manages to get it all the way in there and then she'll lay an egg. Uh, and then she'll lay another egg and another egg and another egg. She lays seven or eight in a row. Then she goes to another twig and does it again. And from the point where she lays those eggs, typically, but not always, the branch dies. That's called flagging. And people get upset. Oh, they're gonna kill my tree. They're not going to kill your tree, but they are going to prune it once every 17 years, and that's okay. Um, then the eggs hatch, and they fall to the ground. The little guys fall to the ground, tunnel underneath the ground, and start to suck on the xylem of plant roots. Um, xylem is, is water, essentially. So a, a single tree can host uh, up to 50,000 nymphs without any measurable effect on the tree at all, because they're really just sucking, sucking water. There's hardly any nitrogen in there at all. I had uh, a student uh, drive around Newark, Delaware and, and uh, record where the flagging was, which, which represented where the oval position was. Um, and these green bars are oaks. So uh, the again, they, they really seem to prefer oaks. They do oviposit on other trees, but more on oaks than any other type of tree. And then they die, that's it. it takes about three weeks uh, and, and they are gone for another 17 years. So that's the big question. Why do they stay underground for 17 years? And the major uh, hypothesis, again, is predator satiation. A lot of things love to eat cicadas, but nothing can wait 17 years in between meals. So the, the populations of the predators that eat cicadas are uh, way too small to eat enough of them to actually control the population. July, this is the when uh, what I say the night chorus begins, and I'm talking about uh, katydids, specifically male katydids, they have a sclerotized uh, hardened part of their forewings, which they raise, and then they scrape it back and forth on a scraper and a file, and they make a characteristic katydid sound. Most of you have heard what katydids uh, sound like. Uh, and if you're wondering why they're singing, this is why. Once upon a time, there was a young woman named Katie who fell in love with a handsome young man. Alas, he did not share her feelings and he married another. Soon thereafter, he and his young bride were found poisoned in their bed. Who perpetrated the crime was never determined, but some say the insects in the trees were watching that night, and each summer they solved the mystery by singing Katie did, Katie did. I hope you can hear that. I did a lot of camping in North Jersey when I was growing up, and that sound multiplied a lot by, by hundreds of Katie dids, sang me to sleep uh, uh, many, many nights. So. I love that sound. Um, there are four species of katydids in our eastern forests. 
uh, only one species in, in the West. So we are where the katydids are happening. This is a female. She's got her ovipositor ready to go. She's not quite uh, mature yet. Her wings haven't expanded. That's what she looks like when she is mature. And if you're wondering why the katydids get so loud uh, in, in the summertime, it's because for the same reason that the cicadas are loud, the females prefer the loudest male. They are going to seek out the male who is singing the loudest because he's going to be the healthiest. Then she will lay her eggs. She glues them. These are large, flat eggs. These guys have already hatched, but she glues them to, to twigs. And sometimes people find these and wonder what they are. Usually that's up in the canopy of the forest and we don't see them. Katie Dids will sing from mid-July right through August into September. And then when you get the first frost, they really, really drop off. Well, speaking of August, this is when oak leaves get really, really tough. And it's a defense against all those caterpillars that want to eat those oak leaves. In the spring, of course, oak leaves are nice and tender. Um, it's, it's, uh, they're a wonderful thing to eat. But by August, they're full of lignans and tannins, and they get stiff as boards. So how can a caterpillar eat a leaf that's stiff as a board? Well, they've got a couple of mechanisms. One is to feed gregariously, where everybody eats together. And typically, the caterpillars uh, eating oaks in August are gregarious. This is the yellow neck caterpillar. Um, and a younger instar. Here it is when it's almost mature. They still are eating together. Apparently, it's easier to get through this tough material when you're feeding together. Uh, the uh, red humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm. So gregarious feeding is very common uh, in, with, with oaks during the summertime. This is the oak we're following. In 2014, I walked around the base of this oak and I, no ladders or anything. And I counted the caterpillars just on the base of the tree. There were 410 caterpillars on the leaves of this tree and 115 of them were yellow neck caterpillars. Pretty big ones eating quite a bit of material. So I took this picture right after I counted. So I can ask you, do you see any of those caterpillars? No. Do you see any of the caterpillar damage? No, it's there, but you don't see it. And this is the distance at which we typically view our trees. But if I knocked on your door and said, you've got 410 caterpillars just on the lower branches, most people would freak out. Ah, get the spray can, call the man, save the tree. You don't have to save the tree. Oaks are really good at sharing some of the energy they captured from the sun, which is why we have caterpillars, which is why we have birds in our, our yard. I met a woman in New Orleans several years ago, Tammany Baumgarten, who suggests we all um, practice the 10-step program. Take 10 steps back from your trees and all your insect problems disappear. Excellent advice. Another approach is to become so small that you can actually mine the leaves. You, you eat the material in between the upper and lower epidermis. That's where the toughness is, but the parenchymal, parenchymal cells the, in the palisade mesophyll are, are still uh, tender and full of nutrition. In other words, you become a leaf miner. Um, so a lot of caterpillars are, are leaf miners. Here's the egg was laid here and the miner hatched with really tiny this is called the serpentine mine because it ends up looking like a snake. The black line in, in here is that's a caterpillar frash, the poops. They put, put, poke it all to the center. Then this is where they pupated. And that's the total amount of leaf material that this caterpillar ate. This is a blotched leaf miner. There's the caterpillar in there. It just goes in a circle and makes a blotch that gets bigger and bigger, but not ever very big. Here it is backlit. And here it is with a very uh, good picture taken by Salvador Batanza. It doesn't look much like a caterpillar uh, because it's got all these adaptations to be a leaf miner. But when it comes out as an adult, it does look like a, a moth. They're small, uh, but it looks just like a moth. This is one of the Camomaria species, the solitary oak leaf miner, gregarious oak leaf miner, the oak tentiform leaf miner, number of species of leaf miners um, getting around that toughness in, that you see in, in leaves at the end of the season. Okay, September is our last month, and it's when we first start to notice crickets. You know, most of our crickets are black and they're on the ground. And by the way, if a cricket gets in your house and sings, it's good luck, so don't hurt it. But there are crickets up on, on trees and bushes too. We call them bush and tree crickets, and they are typically greenish or yellowish, sometimes brown, but never black. They're doing the same thing. The males are trying to attract females by singing the loudest, uh, but these guys are very smart about it they will find a hole in the oak leaf. Uh, and if there's not a hole there, some species actually chew a hole of the right size. Then they stick their head through that hole and raise their wings and move them back and forth and make their chirping sound. 
Most leaves have a slight parabolic shape to them. So that projects the sound farther and louder than if this guy sang on a flat surface. So he's actually sending a false message to the female saying, I am, I am big and strong, even if he's not. If you can imagine that a male will send a female a false message. And she falls for it. She comes, she mates with him. And you might say, well, gee, um, he's taking advantage of her. She might not be getting the biggest male, but she might be getting the smartest male, and that might be good enough. September is also the month you're most likely to see walking sticks, which can be numerous in oak forest, um, but only occasionally. There are records in West Virginia, for example, of walking sticks actually causing defoliation. I've never seen that. I only find one or two a year. Uh, but they spend most of their time in the canopy. This is one that was down low on an emery oak in Arizona that I saw once. This is the species that we have in the, in the east, a diaphora femorata. Um, again, not, not commonly seen until the fall. But they do have an interesting life history. The females will spend their time up in the canopy, and they simply drop eggs to the forest floor. Some of those eggs will hatch that year. Some of the eggs will wait a year and hatch the following year. And some eggs actually hatch two years later. Uh, well, why am I showing you bloodroot? Bloodroot is a spring ephemera, one of many spring ephemerals that has a curious way of reproducing. They make these pods. And when those pods break open, when they dehiss, the eggs are there and they've got this white structure on them called an eliasome. These eliasomes are really tasty to ants. Ants love them, so the ants come. They will pick up the egg or the, the seed, take it back to the nest. Everybody eats the eliasomes. They can't eat the seeds, so they throw it in the garbage dump, uh, which is a perfect place for the, those seeds to germinate. It's about one inch below the surface of the soil. Well, these are uh, walking stick eggs, and they've got a white stripe just like an eliasome. The ants come and pick them up and take them back to the nest. They can't eat them. Uh, and there must be some kind of chemical mimicry here, uh, but um, it, it's all because of the eliasomes on the spring ephemerals. They put these eggs in the garbage dump because they can't eat them. And that is a perfect place for walking stick eggs to hatch in safety. All right, we've made it through the year. We've talked about just some of the things that happen on oaks. Um, so let's Let's on, on a negative and then a positive note. We've got to talk about the biodiversity crisis that we humans have, have created. We hear about you know, birds disappearing and insects disappearing. They're not disappearing, we're killing them. We're killing our birds, we're killing our insects, we're killing nature, which is why we are in the sixth great extinction event the planet has ever experienced. It is a true biodiversity crisis. The good news is it has a grassroots solution. It's something that each one of us can address and each one of us can make a measurable difference. There are four things every landscape must accomplish ecologically, ecological goals of every landscape. Uh, every landscape has to capture carbon, pull it out of the atmosphere, help climate change by locking up that carbon in plant tissues and the soil. Every landscape has to manage the watershed in which it lies. Every landscape has to support a diverse community of pollinators, not for agriculture, but because they pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. And every landscape has to support a complex food web, has to pass energy on so that we have animals in our ecosystems. When you plant an oak, you are addressing all four of those, uh, those serious ecological goals. You're capturing more carbon than other trees will. You're managing the watershed better than other trees will. You're supporting a more complex food web than any other plant. You're even helping pollinators, even though oaks are wind pollinated. If you watch the catkins uh, in the fall or in the spring, very carefully, you'll see the bees come in, they gather up the pollen, now they don't carry it to female flowers, so they're not actually pollinating, but they are, these spring bees are using the uh, oak pollen um, as a, a source of nutrition. Well, despite all these wonderful landscape attributes, our, our uh, oaks are in trouble, particularly the big guys. Um, Pre-emergent herbicides turn out to be a huge problem for oaks uh, where they're being used specifically, uh, or especially in the mid Midwest, Iowa in particular, they cause a condition called oak tatters. This is what normal white oak leaves look like. This is what they look like after those pre-emergence volatilize and blow out of the crops into the forest. Uh, it's really devastating. What's, what's frustrating is the pre-emergent herbicides could be encapsulated so that that doesn't happen, but that costs a little bit more money and nobody wants to pay for that. So we kill our oaks. 
the old giants are gone from our forests. Uh, we, we cut them down to, to make uh, room for agriculture or we needed the wood if we did that hundreds of years ago. The percentage of oaks in our eastern forest has been cut in half in the last century uh, for a number of reasons. We've minimized fire. Oaks really are fire climax uh, uh, species. We've introduced a number of serious oak pests like um, bacterial leaf scorch and oak wilt, uh, sudden oak death syndrome, uh, the gypsy moth, uh, which is now the, the uh, spongy moth. Deer overabundance, serious, serious problem that's that's um, underappreciated. The deer are eating all the baby trees that come up in our, our forest. They don't eat the invasives. They do eat the natives, particularly oaks. So we don't have any oak regeneration. Habitat fragmentation. Now our oaks can be so separated in different little mini habitats that the oak pollen doesn't get from one tree to another. All of those things are reducing the amount of, of uh, healthy oaks in our forests these days. And because of that, 28, 28 of the 91 North American oak species are now threatened. One third of the global oak species are actually endangered. The Oregon white oak, we've talked about that a couple of times, has lost 97% of its range because it grew where Western agriculture is and they've simply gotten rid of it. There are 2,300 species that rely on oaks in Great Britain that are now threatened because of the loss of oaks in Great Britain. We humans live our life out in, in a very brief instant of ecological time and we can't return those giant oaks to the forest during that time, but we can start the process. And in no time at all, the oaks that we plant today, this spring, uh, will reach a size where they are contributing in keystone ways to our ecosystems. It'll be a while before they're 400 years old, but that's okay. They are contributing a lot. Now, we are all responsible for good earth stewardship because we all require good earth stewardship. We all depend on healthy ecosystems. And the best way to exercise your responsibility towards uh, earth stewardship is to embrace the power of oaks. So for the sake of turkeys, chickadees, woodpeckers, warblers, jays, thrushes, fireflies, galls, weevils, orthopterans, moths, for us, for our own sake, plant an oak, plant a living community, plant the future. Thanks very much. You're muted. Thank you, Doc. <laughs> that was excellent. Uh, I feel like we got to sit in on one of your uh, classes, Professor. And there was a there were a lot more laughs in this than I expected. <laughs> that was great. So, anyone who has a question, please enter it in the Q and A area of Zoom, and we will take those one at a time. Uh, one question we have is. You speak mostly of the food and ecological value of white oaks. Can you comment on red oaks? Yeah, um, I don't mean to favor white oaks. That just happens to be the oak that's in front of my yard. It's a white oak. I've got red oaks in my yard too, uh, and they are just as good. Okay, and uh, can you talk a little bit about how oaks help manage the watershed? Well, it's those large root systems. Uh, well, that's one of the ways they do it. Plants hold water on the landscape. If you, you know, if, if water falls on bare soil, it runs right off uh, or, and it washes that soil away. So the plants hold the soil in place. They hold topsoil in place. They create topsoil. The leaf litter becomes a sponge that sponges up a, a lot of water when it rains. The canopy of a large oaks, oak breaks the, the pounding pressure of that rain. Believe it or not, rain can actually compact soil when there's nothing between it and the ground. So the oak intercepts the, the pounding rain, then it just drips down slowly enough that it can infiltrate into our, our water table rather than running off as stormwater. Uh, and large root systems break up the soil so that it's not compacted, so that it helps with that infiltration. Oaks are not the only trees that help with manage the watershed, but because they have such large canopies and such large root systems, they're really, really good at it. Okay, one of their many skills. Another question is, we have a nice oak popping up in our yard, but it's too close to our house. Can you transplant an oak? You can, but do it right away. The faster, the better. You know, 
you can transplant a bigger oak, but then you have to go to all that root pruning. You've got to, you know, you chop off the roots to move it. So the sooner you do it before it develops that giant root system, and the very best time to do it is the first year it pops up above the soil. But I have transplanted oaks that were three years old and gotten away with it. Um, it retards them a little bit when you chop off the roots, but sure, move it so that you can put it in a more productive place. A good time to transplant it is uh, right now or the fall, but not in the middle of the summer. Right, there's a reason Arbor Day is not right in the middle of summer, right? Okay, um, I'll give just a little time in case anyone else has another question to enter. And I just wanna let people know that you can borrow Doug's book, The Nature of Oaks, through our library, through the Minuteman Library Network. And for those at home, I put a link for that in the chat. And I also put a link to bookshop.org where you can purchase a copy of Doug's book. So I have a feeling attendees are going to want to learn a lot more about what happens each month during the year to the Oaks. And we hope they do, and we hope they take your good advice and, if possible, plant an oak if they can. It's possible. <laughs> if uh, anyone else uh, has any questions, we'll take them. And if not, we will say goodnight here, and we will once again thank the Maynard Council on Aging and the Friends of the Maynard Public Library for funding tonight's program. And thank you, Doug, for spending this time with us. Uh, we're already getting comments here. Fabulous talk, thank you, says one commenter. And I'm sure we're going to hear lots more good feedback in the days to come. So thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Doug, and good night. Take care. <laughs>